Well, we're in chapter 26, and uh, we just finished it up, and we neglected to share one truth with you that even the heathen, like Abimelech, seemed to recognize when God had his hand on somebody. And I think the same thing should be true of Christians. When the heathen see a Christian, they ought to be able to see that God's got their hand on them. And if they can't, maybe we're not living as God intended for us to live. So that's a kind of a closing thought on chapter 26. In chapter 27, John Phillips says, it's one of the saddest chapters in the book of Genesis. Now that's saying a lot for John Phillips because the book of Genesis is a lengthy book. It has a lot of real sad things that happened. Uh, Cain slaying Abel was certainly sad. Uh, the fact that there had to be a worldwide flood is certainly sad. Uh, the daughters of Lot having incestual relationship with Lot, certainly sad. The depravity of Sodom and Gomorrah, certainly sad. So why would John Phillips, a uh, writer of it, an incredibly good commentary on Genesis, say that chapter 27 is one of the saddest chapters in the book of Genesis. Well, he goes on and says the reason he feels that way is because no one did what was right. This was a family unit. This was Isaac. This was Jacob. This was Esau. And this was Rebekah. A family unit, a grandfather, if you will, and two boys and a wife. And yet, John says, nobody did what was right. It's sad, isn't it? That is sad when nobody in the family does what's right. And so in Genesis chapter 27, verses 1 through 4, Isaac is very old likely blind and that's why this deception was so easy to pull off. Feeble perhaps, maybe a little confused. Nevertheless, we find that he requests his son Esau, who he had always favored, to go out and kill some game for him so that he might have a last meal, if you will. Now, he lived a long time after this, but he kind of felt like he was at the end of his life. And Rebecca overheard this request for this meal and a promise for a blessing. And since she favored Jacob, which again we learn is not the right thing for a parent to do to favor a child over another, she tells Jacob, but she does way, way more than telling Jacob. She plots a strategy for Jacob to steal the blessing of Esau. And she not only plots, but she actually becomes a significant part of the plot. For all that Jacob does is go get the food. She cooks it. She gives it to him. She dresses him in Esau's clothes. She helps put furs over Jacob's skin so that he'll even feel like Esau. And she plots the whole thing out. Now Jacob questions it first, but he doesn't question the deceptiveness of it as much as the fear of being caught. <laughs> I wonder how many of us have been in that position that it wasn't our sin that was so bad, it was the fear of being caught in our sin that was so bad. In any case, he brings the food to his father. His father is absolutely uncertain that this is really Esau. And yet, they've gone so far with this deception that even when he thinks that the voice is that of Jacob and not of Esau, he does not only eat the food, but he gives Jacob a blessing. And when Esau comes in and finds uh, that his father has given the blessing, he becomes so angry that he wants to kill his brother Jacob. Now, 
that's sad too, isn't it? So we have a deceptive wife who favors a son, which is wrong, who plots a strategy which is filled with deception and lies. And we find that Jacob, in lying to his father, that one lie leads to another, as it always does. Lies tend to cause us to have to lie over and over again to cover our first lie. No wonder John Phillips said that this is one of the saddest chapters in the Bible. Well, excuse me, not in the Bible, but in the book of Genesis. No wonder he saw so much harm going on here. Now, we know that God had already said that Esau would serve Jacob. We know that this plays out God's plan for Jacob to have the blessings of God upon him and not on Esau. Uh, but we all know that even though that may have been God's plan, uh, the actions of the family members are absolutely incorrect. And, and so we see this interesting story. And we see Rebecca's dishonesty, lack of submissiveness as a wife. We see Jacob's challenge. And we see the fact that even though he knows it's wrong, he goes along with a plan and one lie leads to another. And then we see the blessings uh, that Isaac gave to both Jacob and Esau. The blessings that Esau felt which should be his went to Jacob. The blessings that he gave to Esau almost seemed like a curse to me. Uh, but in any case, we find this interesting story now, what else can we learn from it? Well, we not only should learn about favoritism and how that can affect our thinking and our going outside of the will of God, uh, but I think it's very important for us to realize that we should want to bless all of our children equally. We should want to pray for all of our children equally, not play favorites. And we should definitely pray for God's blessings on their lives for the future. So I thought I'd close out this thought for the day with the blessing that Isaac gave to Jacob, which is the kind of blessing that we should give to all of our children, the kind of prayer we should pray for all of our children. And that will be my thought for the day. So let's take a look at Isaac's blessing of Jacob. Now may God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine. Notice that prayer is all about material things. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. Well, I said it was going to be the closing for this devotion, but... As I looked at that blessing again, I couldn't help but to come back and say to you, what else would you add to that blessing for your children? I know what I would add. You see, most all of that blessing was on not only God's will for Jacob, but it was about material things. It was about honor and position. But it wasn't a lot about spiritual uh, I think that the kind of prayers that we should be praying for our children are more spiritual and less material. Oh yeah, we don't want our kids to have to struggle and eke out a living. We'd like them to have some blessings of material wealth, but shouldn't we be more concerned about their spiritual well-being, about their potential mates, about their health? You see, as I looked at that prayer and that prayer of blessing, it was more of one of head of the household leaving his possessions and his position to Esau, but it was really Jacob, instead of praying for him to have discernment about the right mate, about drawing closer to God, about living for God and glorifying God in all that he did. Why not take a minute or two, pray for your children whether they're young or whether they're old. And pray for spiritual things in their lives, not just material things. And that's my thought for the day. God bless you and have a great day.